We have now come to the section on payment to directors and disclosure of their remuneration and other benefits. A company director can receive an income or payment for their services in a few different ways. The different ways in which directors can receive fees, salaries, and executive remuneration can be confusing. First, let's have a look at the differences in different types of payment. What's director's remuneration? Director's remuneration is the process by which directors of a company are compensated. It can be made through fees, salary, or the use of company's property. If the company employs you in a role other than a director, it can pay you a salary. Like any other employee, the company may also need to pay you superannuation. Directors' fees are compensation for services performed by directors in the capacity of directors. As a director, if you are not also an employee of the company, you could be entitled to receive a director's fee instead of a salary. Of course, there are some procedural requirements. The corporations and the corporate governance principles made by the Australian Securities Exchange suggest the director's fees can be in the form of cash, non-cash benefits, superannuation contribution, or salary sacrifice into equity, etc. The company's constitution, replaceable rules, or shareholders' resolution approve the fees for directors. At the same time, the company sanctions the travel costs and other proper expenses that the directors spend for the company's business. Executive remuneration refers to salaries and bonuses paid to executives as senior company employees. Such remuneration is part of the executive's employment contract with the organization. The board of directors determines executive remuneration and bonuses. Some senior executives will also be directors, that is, executive directors, but they usually will receive no extra fee for serving on the board. The executive remuneration is a package covering all payments. If the company's constitution provides that, the directors may fix their own salary. It's not a good corporate governance practice, but it doesn't breach the law. If the directors receive excessive payments, it may be oppressive or unfair for the shareholders who don't hold the position of director. It's quite obvious that the more remuneration paid to the directors, the less profit the shareholders will get. Details of the director's remuneration are disclosed in the company's annual financial report. This is how the shareholders can find out about the remuneration and other benefits paid to directors, and the relationship between the payment and the performance. The disclosure of remuneration and other benefits is regulated not only by the Corporations Act but also by relevant accounting standards. Generally, listed companies have greater and more detailed disclosure on remuneration. In the following two slides, I will use the Commonwealth Bank as an example to illustrate the remuneration of directors and executives. The data is available from the Commonwealth Bank's annual report in 2016. Here we can see the total remuneration of the board and executives. If we compare the second and the fourth column, we can see the executives' remuneration is much larger than those of the non-executive directors 
about ten times larger. Therefore, it may be misleading if you mix the executives and non-executives remuneration. In this slide, you can see the breakdown of remuneration of directors and executives. Here I take the chairman and the CEO as examples. I will not go through these items in detail, but they are available in the 2016 annual report if you are interested. I listed the company's annual general meeting. The resolution to adopt the remuneration report must be put to vote by the shareholders. Before voting, the chair of the annual general meeting must give the shareholders a reasonable opportunity to ask questions, to make comments about the remuneration report. This can help shareholders express their opinions, gain further understandings, or get clarification on some items, as well as make management accountable. However, please note, even if a majority of the shareholders vote against the resolution, the vote is advisory only. The vote is advisory only, and it doesn't bind the director or the company. Although the shareholders vote on the remuneration report for a listed company is advisory only, it's not a tiger without teeth. In 2011, an amendment to Corporations Act introduced a two-strikes and re-election process. It came into effect on July 1, 2011. The two-strikes law was introduced to address the concerns about the excessive executive remunerations between the 1990s and 2007. It's designed to hold directors accountable for executive salaries and bonuses. Under this mechanism, if shareholders disagree with the executive's remuneration, the entire board of the company may face re-election. Uh, let's look at the first strike. At the company's annual general meeting, when a company's remuneration report receives a no vote of 25% or more by shareholders, then the first strike occurs. At the next year's AGM, at the next year's annual general meeting, the company must include an explanation in its remuneration report of the response to the no vote but why no action has been taken if the company has taken no action at all. If a company's subsequent remuneration report also receives a no vote of 25% or more, then the second strike occurs. When a second strike occurs at the same annual general meeting, the shareholders will vote on the resolution to determine whether all the directors will need to stand for re-election. This resolution is called a spill resolution. If this spill resolution passes with 50% or more of the eligible votes cast, then a spill meeting will take place in 90 days. Pay attention to the threshold of 50%. It's different from the 25% in the first and second strike. In this process, key management personnel and closely related parties are prohibited from voting on these resolutions. That is, they are not allowed to vote on the remuneration report and on whether the directors must stand for re-election. However, there is an exception. It occurs when a shareholder gives an undirected proxy to the chair, 
and the shareholder expressly authorizes the chair to exercise the proxy. So far, the two strikes and re-election mechanism has been implemented for about six years. There are some pros and cons of this mechanism. Research shows that the CEO's pay declined under this mechanism. Research also shows it can help increase shareholders' engagement and improve transparency and quality of disclosure. Overall, it has been useful in addressing the concerns of excessive executive payment and in making directors accountable. Generally speaking, listed companies have greater and more detailed remuneration disclosure. There are some items that must be disclosed by listed companies. These include the following. First, the details of contracts in which a director is a party or receives a benefit. Second, the key terms and conditions including remuneration in a contract of the appointment of the CEO. Finally, the annual report should disclose the corporate governance practices and the, and the extent of compliance with the corporate governance principles and recommendations made by the Australian Securities Exchange. In addition, directors' margin loans or similar financing arrangements should be disclosed. What's a margin loan? Let's have a look at uh, the definition provided by ASIC. A margin loan lets you, to, lets you borrow money to invest and it uses your shares or managed funds as a security. It can help you increase your returns, but it can also magnify your losses. Margin loans are for dedicated investors who actively monitor and manage their investments. If a substantial amount of the director's shares are used as security, the company's share prices may be affected. Therefore, margin loans or similar financing arrangements should be disclosed. Let's now discuss the company secretary. A public company must have at least one secretary if it has more secretaries, at least one of them must ordinarily reside in Australia. A proprietary company is not required to have a secretary. However, if it does have one or more secretaries, at least one of the secretaries must ordinarily reside in Australia. A secretary is an officer. That is, he or she is subject to the statutory duties of officers and employees. As I mentioned before, a CEO is also considered an officer. The board decides the terms of office and the conditions of employment for the secretaries. The board probably has the power of dismissal. Why do I say probably? because neither the Corporations Act nor the replaceable rules specify who has such dismissal power. It's not clear from the law. There is no statutory requirement on special skills or qualifications for being a secretary. But companies often require their secretaries to have some expertise or qualifications, for example, in law, finance, or accounting. A secretary can be described as the company's chief administrative officer. The secretary has the customary authority to make contracts connected with administration of the company. The secretary also has the power to co-witness the affixation of the company seal pursuant to a board resolution. There are also some statutory responsibilities on the company secretary 
under Section 188 of the Corporations Act. However, I will not give a detailed introduction here. For listed companies, the Secretary also has the responsibility of transmitting the company's continuous disclosure to the Australian Securities Exchange. It also has the responsibility of maintaining appropriate board records. Defective appointment of directors or secretary, the constitution, the replaceable rules, or the Corporations Act have some requirements concerning the appointment and disqualifications of directors and a secretary. If there is a technical defect in their appointment, then the appointment of the director or secretary is invalid. However, if the director or secretary has acted, then such an act is effective. For example, if the appointment of a director is defective, but the director has called a meeting, then the act of calling the meeting is still effective. Okay, this is the end of my lecture covering basic knowledge about company directors in Australia. I hope it's helpful in improving your understanding in this area. If you have any questions, just contact me by my email wei.cai at rmit.edu.au